Okay, I think we can start and I want to say hello everyone. Thank you for joining and welcome to today's Society3 Deep Innovation Design Seminar. My name is Marita Schulze, co-founder of the Society3 Group, chair of the World Innovations Forum Foundation, and it's really great to see and the pleasure having with us today attendees from all continents. I think this is you know, all continents from Africa, Australia, Asia, Europe, South and North America. In total, I was just looking to the attendee list, 24 countries worldwide. And it's also great to see so many familiar names with us. So thanks everyone for joining. Before we start, please allow me to share a few housekeeping. There is no need to do screenshots. We will record the webinar and make it available in the next days on the Society3 webpage. Please share all your questions during the presentation and just type them into the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel. We will do our very best to answer them at the end of the webinar or follow up with you directly. Okay, let me now hand over to Axel Schulze, founder and CEO of Society3 Group at EG and chairman of the World Innovations Forum. Axel started and successfully exited four companies, the biggest reaching 5 billion in revenue, the second close to 1 billion, and he is also a published author and patent holder. 2015 listed in the global 100 most influential startup accelerators. 2008, Axel won the San Francisco Entrepreneur Award. He chaired the SAS General Committee at the SIA in the US. And also he was a very early advisor 2003 of LinkedIn. Axel and I really lived the majority of our business life in Silicon Valley. For the past year, he is on a quest to find out how the brain is creating and processing ideas and how some of those ideas could become disruptive to an entire industry segment. Axel, without further ado, if, if you please take over. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, oops, that was the wrong button. <laughs> Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for joining. And uh, let me just dive in. So today we're talking about innovation and the rethinking of the innovation process or the act of innovation. Uh, like Marita said, I mean, we have been looking into this topic of innovation um, the last couple of years uh, very intensely. I mean, more than I did ever before. But interestingly enough, on my personal blog, the first post, I think it was 2006, I started with innovation. Little did I know where I'm ending up with this. <laughs> so um, when, we, when we talk about innovation then, and let me say this first, this is not incremental improvements. Innovation means uh, substantial change and I like this kind of expression of innovation is when a whole industry segment shifts the way they do things or the way they provide things or the way they actually uh, help customers to do things, which means uh, that is sometimes radical. We also then call it disruptive. And that's what we are talking about today. So um, when we when we think about innovation, um, it, it's not only, oh, yeah, let's innovate. I mean, th there are a couple interesting things behind it, and I want to share it right away. So you see in this picture, AlphaGo, um, some of the, you probably mo know what AlphaGo is. Uh, just real quick, it's a computer that uh, that actually, you know, steered up the world a little bit, I have to say, in uh, 2015, 2016, when AlphaGo, the first AI system, um, actually beat the best human on Earth on Go, a board game. And Go is not considered just a logical game. It's actually also considered, you know, stressing the human uh, uh, intuition uh, to, the, to the max. And so it was thought that a computer could never do that. Um, there came a, another series afterwards. So AlphaGo was uh, trained by going through hundreds of thousands of Go games to learn how Go works. 
and uh, later on came AlphaGo Zero. And the zero stands for nothing to learn. The, the, the computer, the AI system has to figure out the game as it plays and then runs through all the iteration itself. And AlphaGo Zero uh, beats AlphaGo in every single game without having actually go through millions of millions of things to learn. Now, if these two machines could actually communicate, that would be a substantial shift. And this will come. It doesn't exist today, but it will come. And so we're, we're thinking about the act of innovation, not as iterations and production and, you know, calculating more lines or more things than ever before possible, but innovation and or creation very much in the same camp uh, actually enables humans to do something like building AlphaGo or building uh, the little guy. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to avoid the name because behind me <laughs> it would come up. Oh, yeah. Um, now, in the past 12,000 years, this is when the agricultural revolution started 12,000 years ago. We made it that we're basically in the, in the highly developed countries, about 3% of the population works in agriculture and farmers and feeds the rest of the entire population. That is an unheard of actually uh, achievement. And we believe that the degree of automation on the industrial side will actually get to the same way. Now, when the agricultural revolution started, then lots and lots of people um, flocked and there was nothing they could lose because there was nothing else before of that power. But when the industrial revolution starts, people went from the farms into the cities and into these uh, industry complexes. And there was a thought or a fear that we actually starve to death because nobody uh, is able to uh, provide the food anymore. But we found out ways to produce and to, to optimize and to maximize and so forth. Now, we will do the same thing on the industrial automation, meaning we will have machines, and whether this is AI or not really doesn't matter. We will have machines in the degree of automation that is in the 90 plus percent range, which then arises the question again, okay, what is the rest doing? And I think the rest will actually innovate. And uh, why and how, that's the topic of today. So allow me to do a test because innovation and creativity is often the same camp. And I want to test your creativity really quickly. And the, the results, you will be completely astounded probably. So here it goes. Create whatever you like. I mean, that's creativity, right? You can do anything. There's no limits. There's no borders. There's no size. There's no anything. And take a platypus and Lexicrypt. So create something creative with a platypus and Lexicrypt. And uh, you may say, well, I don't know one or the other or even both. Doesn't matter. Creative, right? So create something in your mind. And we come back to that a little bit later with a platypus and with a Lexicrypt. Okay. So I leave you with that. Sorry, it hurts a little bit. I know there is not the resolution right now, but uh, I will obviously resolve the issue. So when we look into autumn, into innovation, we probably need to understand that innovation is a sum of all fear, so to speak, is a concentrated work together team to actually innovate together. And so empowering a team is sort of the core and the first step in innovation. This is very different and already kind of, uh, uh, goes away from classical thinking, you know, engineer think and build something and then we have innovation and then we will market it. Um, we realized over the last probably 20 years that it's not working that way. The most disruptive companies are startups, not the enterprises anymore. And these disruptive companies are teams. And when these disruptors get into the market, they get into the market as team. And there is a 100% true, so to speak, uh, logic behind it. There is no innovation without a team. So we know we need the team. And all innovation that we had came from a team. So it's very probable 
that we need to have a team and work together. And what we all, in all companies, in all the businesses, need to understand that to make a dream work is teamwork. So we need teams. And in the next 10 years, we will need more innovators than you can imagine today. I mean, theoretically, you would say, gosh, I mean, we're 7.8 billion people, of which about uh, 4 billion people are adults. And if 4 billion people should be in all innovators, that would be totally crazy. This is absurd. Well, if you go just 200 years back in time, 5 million years we exist, 200 years is basically no time. People thought the same thing. I mean, it was unimaginable that all the people go into the industries and nobody hangs out in the farms and in the forests and so on. Today it's 3%. You know, so 3% feed 97%. And in the next probably 50 years, so it's a long time. This is not like tomorrow. But when we know what direction we're going, we can be prepared today. And we will need more innovators than we can think because we have more unsolved problems. And the number of unsolved problems is actually growing. Uh, nobody knows exactly how many. Uh, we tried to research that. We couldn't find any, any tangible number, but we know it's in the millions and billions. So we have lots and lots of problems to solve. And so if we have lots and lots of intelligent people, um, then that would be a way to do it. That said, um, <clears throat> for instance, oops, one, one, one invention could be um, a presentation that knows that I'm always going forward and the, the backward button is somewhere else. <laughs> um, so let me look uh, in, into a couple innovations in the past. And uh, there is an interesting dynamic in this list. So automobile, this was 1880-ish. Uh, the television, it's 19, I don't know, 40 or 30, the first, and then 50s, it really came. Personal computers, 1980s. IKEA came out in the same time, completely disrupting the, the furniture business. Then in, in the 1990s, we had internet, also at the same time, Amazon and Google. And short thereafter, Salesforce, Facebook, IoT, Uber, Tesla, Airbnb, eBanks, and currently anti-aging, silicon batteries, autonomous driving, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and so on. So the, interest about, the interesting thing about this, this um, list is the dynamics. So automobile was the thing for a long time. And then television was the other thing for a long time. And today we don't have the next big thing because it, it runs almost constantly with new technologies and every significant new technology actually is by far less recognized, even though they may have a bigger impact than the automobile, because simply there's so much coming up. And um, if we look at the tree of innovation, like, you know, when you start with a spear and how this became a rocket, there's many, 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 many steps in between. It's actually some hundred thousand years in between. But in the today's iteration, we're talking about years maybe. Uh, sometimes within the same year, we have the same quantum leaps of innovation. So there's something that we have to understand. First, we're built to innovate. I mean, we humans, since 300,000 years, if you go 300,000 years back, this is kind of when we started to innovate. Uh, 12,000 years, radical innovation. 200 years, again, radical innovation. And now if we consider this the innovation age, as many people do, um, it goes even faster. So with that said, we need to understand more about innovation and how this actually works. And if we look at the challenges that we have, I mean, basically every industry captain has this, you know, how are ideas actually created? If somebody asks you, you know, if your boss or yourself being asked, okay, boss, how do I innovate? Tell me, how do I do that? What's your answer? Yeah, I think this, think that, blah, blah, blah. We have no answer to this question, not till just more or less now. What is the idea to be successful? And will the idea be successful? And it's hard to tell, we don't really know. So we have to experiment and do all kinds of things. And will we get disrupted from others? 
I mean, right now we know everybody has a 50-50 chance, no matter how big the enterprise is or how small the startup is. Each of us and every one of us can be disrupted by some other you know, company with a mega idea. But what does this company do to get this idea? Then how much would we need to do uh, uh, to, to invest? And this, this question is very hard to answer because we, we, we simply, oops, uh, I don't know what this is here. Is my mouse maybe? Uh, it's simply hard because the, the, the predictions of the success and the predictions of the outcome is so vague that it's very hard to uh, actually predict anything. And then what, what the team would look like. And this is funny. We talked about team before, but now we're actually thinking more like, yeah, the engineering team. In more than 60% of all businesses, innovation is given to the IT group or to the engineering group or the scientists and so forth. And we will learn in a few minutes that this is one reason why innovation is not happening in enterprises, because not because they are stupid, no, because they cannot innovate for a very specific reason. We will we'll look into that. And then where do we start? And since everything is kind of vague and unknown, it's very difficult. So we start with experimentation, trying to figure it out. And this is the way how we humans start anything and everything when we don't know. And honestly, when I was asked this one question, Axel, how do you innovate? Tell me step by step. I didn't know either. And we were looking around and we try to find out. I mean, obviously with building four innovative companies, I look at what did I do? What did I think? Where, where did the th thoughts come from? But then this is still, still me and there's many others. So we interviewed some others. But at the end of the day, it was like always, the thought for what we were talking about today came from a very different direction, not from the innovators, even though we are some and there is a major contribution to that thought, but actually the spark came somewhere else. So let me share with you real quick um, a little bit of past. So this was Computer 2000, um, and we had this business model situation that we said, you know, we don't want to go direct. We go exclusively through partners. And back then, everybody told me, actually, this is stupid. You cannot do this. You will never succeed. This is mathematical, uh, not possible, people said, and so forth. Um, to make a long story short, 10 years later, we bypassed 8,000 uh, of the world's biggest tech distributor, became number three, and um, the thing was possible. So the question is, I mean, wow, startup and bypassing multi-hundred million dollar companies. So that was clearly disruptive and clearly innovative. But this was distribution. This was not a tech company. We didn't invent anything other than a business model. And so here's another company of mine, Blue Roads, you know, um, exited uh, Computer 2000, started a new company in Silicon Valley. And when we got there, uh, I had a similar trouble. You said, yeah, I mean, yeah, pretty, pretty <laughs> interesting background. I mean, bringing Computer 2000 there, but honestly, I mean, you know, here Silicon Valley different and you can't, you will not succeed. You have two, two major competitors with millions in the bank. And even if we angel investors, if we, if we put in five or seven or two million, it doesn't matter. You know, you cannot out money them. I mean, just, just from the money point of view. Um, five years later, we became market leader in that space. About 50% of the Fortune 500 tech companies were actually using Blue Roads. So then we looked into other companies. Um, I had an opportunity to talk to the Airbnb founders once, and they told me their story. They wanted to go to New York, and they typically, when they sort of roam around in the, in the US, uh, they always have friends somewhere, and that moment, Unfortunately not. And um, I don't remember what it was, an event or so. So they couldn't get anything. And then they asked a couple of friends of friends of friends. And finally, they got their apartment in New York. And they thought, OK, if we put up a platform where people can actually show their open opportunities, open, open houses, and so on, and others who wanted them, well, why not? And the idea was not to compete with hotels. The idea was those people who want to have, instead of the hotel experience, they want to have the private life experience, a bigger fridge, 
hang out, invite friends, you know, sleep as long as they want, don't need to worry about anything, don't have a clock saying, okay, breakfast is over. All this was not in their intention. And I can fully subscribe to that because I fit squarely into this pattern. So they grew and grew and grew and disrupted basically the hotel business. That at least this was what people thought. But until today, hotels did not understand what Airbnb is about. And this is one of the interesting things. And I had the same experience with Computer 2000. People did not understand that our business model was the only reason why we succeeded across the globe, basically. And Airbnb is the same. So the hotel still, still today, I mean, when we go in a hotel, which is rare, we ask once in a while, and they said, yeah, this is all this cheap stuff. Um, you know, we don't see them as a competitor. I mean, we're five star and blah, blah, blah. Um, did not understand. It's not about the five stars. It's not about the price. It's not about the comfort. It's about the way of living. And that was represented in that business model. And if we look at Uber, we find the same thing. I mean, you know, you call an Uber, you can call a taxi, but when you call an Uber, the first thing is you see that this car is coming and you know the name who's actually driving. And so, hey, are you Joe? Yeah, are you Axel? Yeah. I mean, this welcoming question is already far step ahead of, okay, where do you wanna go? Ma, mm, driving. <laughs> yeah. The experience, again, is different. Uber is not a tech company at the end of the day. It's a customer experience that Uber is selling. And so when we go through all, and many of these other companies, and you can call them whatever you want, at the end of the day, these are the disruptors of the respective industry. You know, Think of salesforce.com the same way and so forth. So the question is, how is it possible with $15,000 or $50,000 to build a billion dollar company? and basically crack into a market of a large enterprise and the enterprise does not know and does not understand how to fight back. So most enterprises start to fight back the legal way, find any kind of loophole to kill the, the innovation because they can't deal with it, they can't grab it. And so that is a sad situation, but it shows how unable many enterprises are and this goes across all industries. So um, when we try to find out what is it actually that makes the difference, we thought, okay, we can think forever. I mean, you know, one of the thoughts we actually had is when we don't know how our brain works, how can we use the brain to figure that out? That was very difficult because the brain is we and we are the brain. And if you go into this very deep, you realize, okay, you get very philosophical at this point. So we stopped this right away and said, no, what else is similar in this regard? And so we found athletes. You know, these are athletes climbing up mountain. In this case, it's Half Dome, Yosemite Park uh, in California. And uh, you know, the, in the 50s, it took between seven and 10 days to get all the way up. So they slept in the cracks and until they finally was up there. And you can read the stories in Wikipedia. 50 years later, two hours, 20 minutes. I mean, fundamental change. They're still climbing, they're still having hooks, they're still having ropes, uh, maybe a little bit better equipment, but not to get seven days down to two hours, 20 minutes. Look at the skier, athlete, Olympic winner in the 50s, same type, different guy, a little bit different gear, of course, in 50 years later. I mean, perfectly balanced and goes down the slope, I mean, just amazingly. And this guy, also in the 50s, you know, he's, he's balancing his bike and, uh, you know, people thought, wow, this is impossible. You know, this is impossible. And we will see maybe in the future if there's more. So the question is, how was that transformation possible? I mean, was it biological evolution? I mean, in 50 years? No, this is impossible. So the question is, what happened in 50 years to make these humans almost like aliens. If you would send anybody from today back you know, in the 50s and perform with them their acts, people would believe there are aliens because it would be considered physically impossible. The difference is the top athletes today know their body better and in more detail than ever before in history. 
uh, actually, this idea came from one of my sons. He said, you know, that we can actually train a single muscle. <laughs> what can you do? I was blown away. And um, I realized there's something going on that has happened in, in this time. And so, so this was driving me to make that as an analogy to what we could possibly do on the innovation side. Because apparently human people, humans, you know, uh, homo sapiens can do something within a short period of time, which is considered to be impossible. Technology, business models, even our own body. So that is when we started to rethink innovation. We know we need to know our brain. I mean, this is where the ideas are created and we don't know even how. So if we don't know, how could we ever tell somebody else, okay, this is how you be innovative, step by step, you remember? Figure it out, yeah, I mean, that's certainly an answer, but that leads almost automatically to accidental, possible, not possible solutions, but this is neither manageable, this is not controllable, and this is something what we humans like. We like to manage things, and if we know we can manage it because we have all the data, we know it gets done. The second thing is, and that was something I learned from some of the sports guys, they need to know their terrain, and they know it better than any, even the most local people who know kind of theoretically every hole in the mountain, they know better. And so we need to understand the needs and the dreams of our audience. Just imagine, I mean, all these people have needs and they have dreams. You know, some people, oh, you know, it would be so cool if they could do that, but uh, yeah, you know, forget it. These dreams is the feed for the next innovation. And right now there's only one category of people who find out, and these are startups. Because the small teams who have an enormous desire to go big, they talk to them, very simple. And they find out, you know, what would be ideal for you? And I did this myself many times. The first time in Computer 2000, I wanted to find out what would be the ideal distribution model. And I had my idea and actually I processed it. But the thing is to get to the idea, there was some hurdle that I actually realized. And so we need to know how our brain works, but then we also need to know how our terrain is. And the third thing, and I learned this also from one of these Olympic winners, a friend of mine, he said, you know, the gear and the equipment makes a difference. Not like over the 50 years that we have seen, because somebody also told me that was actually a skier who said, you know, we would not be able back then, even if you give us the equipment to compete with any of them, because they know their body so much better than we did back in the days. So, but these three things, equipment and training, the understanding of the terrain, or in our case, the market, and understanding how our thing works that we play with, the body or the brain, are the three things we found out are utmost critical. If we don't know about one of the three, we cannot innovate. So we need all the three, they're inclusive. You know, if we take one out, not working. So let me start with the brain, because this is obviously, uh, the biggest challenge for most people. And uh, so let's start there. And there's actually a shocking realization. Homo sapiens is not able to create anything. Homo sapiens, we all are not creative at all. So when I heard this the first time from a neuroscientist in Stanford, California, uh, Dr. David Eagleman, I thought, oh, come on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you need to know me. I am a creative but I realized I am really not. And it was very logical when I heard him speak, because what, like what you see here, these um, end capsules of the neurons, um, they are responsible basically for processing information in the widest thing. Uh, oftentimes it's just emotion, it's chemical, including some electricity. So through these wires here is go going some electricity, but also chemicals. And they cannot process something that it was not experienced by this body where they're in. So if we haven't seen something, if we would never have seen a platypus, we don't know what a platypus is, then we cannot do anything with it. 
because we are not creative. We cannot create another platypus if we didn't have the first experience about platypus at least once in our life. And so when I was in Australia about 20 years ago for the first time, I learned what a platypus is, a very rare little animal, pretty cute, pretty cool. And so, but if I wouldn't have that experience, you know, somebody could have told me, okay, you need to buy a platypus. Okay, is this a car? Is this an animal? Is this a house? I mean, what is it? No idea. Now, remember our test, LexiCrypt? And this is where I probably caught you. None of you, none of you in the, in the whole audience in the whole world know what LexiCrypt is because LexiCrypt doesn't exist. Now you can say, ah, here's a creation. Yes, it's sort of a creation, but actually it's not. It's basically reassembling, recomposing letters, an L, an E, an X, and so on. So LexiCrypt doesn't exist, and therefore your brain could not do anything with LexiCrypt. And probably many of you didn't know what a polypus is, so the game was completely off. You couldn't do anything. And so that proves pretty nicely that, okay, with a creativity, that's actually a, a different thing. But when we learned that all new ideas are compositions of previous experiences, so if you experience a mouse and maybe my clock here, and you say, okay, do something very creative, then we can be a little bit creative. We can put a clock on the mouse. And so I would always have a clock on my mouse and that I could consider creative, I could consider innovative even, is probably not, but, but this is what we can do. Now, when you look at Dali's paintings, you know, the, the, the artist, uh, Salvador Dali. So you may have seen this elephant with the very tiny legs and so on. Yeah, very creative, isn't it? But it's still an elephant, it's still legs, it's still on earth, it's still a blue sky. I mean, you can paint it red, you can paint it green, but whatever you want, but it's still existing experiences. You can paint it with a different color that you have never seen, right? Impossible. Imagine a color that you have never seen. You cannot. I mean, physically, because we have the, the, the spectrum of, of light and so on, so we can say, well, there is no other color because we have seen them all. Great. But have you ever heard a color? Because that's also the spectrum, electro waves. Well, there are actually people who pretend or maybe even can listen to colors, but we cannot. So. We're bound into a real, real world with everything we have. And our ideas are compositions of that. Now, when we, when we understand that we're not creative, but compositive, and we understand that we have this done in our brain, like 86 billion neurons. On the upper, end, uh, upper right hand side, you see the organellus. This is basically the endpoint of these uh, neurons. I mean, look at this thing. I mean, this looks like a computer. I mean, even so it's a biological computer, but it looks like a computer. And we have 86 billion. This is more than computers on earth. Just think about it. So when we look into our brain, there's another thing that is actually interesting to understand. And you see this in the middle here, um, this, this, this web of connections between one and the other brain half. This is called the corpus callosum. And trust me, I don't want to make you a brain expert. I don't want to make you a neuroscientist, but there's a couple things that are interesting to understand. And in particular, this one. So here are 200 million of these fibers, these nerves between one and the other brain half. And these nerves are responsible for communicating the creative part and the logical part. And neuroscientists found out a long time ago, the creative part actually cannot deal with letters and numbers and the physical existence of things. It's all about emotions and therefore creativity and so on, which actually is compositivity. And on the left-hand side, we have the logical part. And so these both parts work together and they do something very important. And we have to basically thank this invention of nature 
that we're still alive because whenever something happens, these two can associate uh, all kinds of experiences and come up with an answer really quickly. So elephant over there, okay, I know the elephant is fast, but probably not as fast as me in the bush. So I go in the bush and the elephant will go away. Oh, no, no, not elephant, oh, tiger or lion. Well, he can hunt me. So what do I do? Freeze, dead. And freeze meaning do nothing because these things may let you alone or come close enough that they smell, okay, this is the human flesh, it's not, not on my diet, it's not on my menu, so it goes away. Now, when we learned that freezing and doing nothing is saving more lives than innovating over the last five million years, then we begin to understand why this thing actually may introduce to us with a crazy idea, no, you better do nothing. When we understand that, we know why even the best ideas get blocked by our corporate colossum. And the best ideas, we also know, you know, the spark that comes out first is actually typically the best idea. Now, when we take these two things, we already realize that when we have great ideas, which we all have, by the way, then most of them get actually not blocked, but shortly thereafter, when they come across, wind away. If we understand that, and if we know that, and if we experience that, which we do, when we carefully listen, we know, okay, ah, that was, a, no, was this a good idea? I don't remember, oh, gone. And that's how it works, because it protects us. But today, we're not really endangered from wild animals. We're, at least in the Western world or developed world, we're not starving hunger anymore. There are still a lot of people who do, but in some areas not. And so in these areas where we know, okay, we will be okay, we will not starve hunger, and we will not basically be eaten by another animal, we can actually work with our brain to let these ideas through and catch it and then work with these ideas because the first ideas oftentimes are the best. Sometimes it's the iteration of ideas, but that is something we have to find out. So we know that our brain is actually accessible from us because we feel these spontaneous ideas and most of the times we neglect it because the brain tells us to let it, let it go because it doesn't work for you. Okay, this is an energy problem. You know, if you want to do this, this takes you a year or two, but you are busy in, you know, working in a manufacturing and forget it. But when we overcome this, and this is what entrepreneurs do, and they don't have a different brain. They just have this little bit more time to catch these ideas. So without going too far into it, I said I don't want to make you a brain surgeon, that we don't want to make a neuroscientist or anything. The very same way we don't want to make you understand this chip. 6.9 billion transistors are on this chip. Memories and calculators and everything. Uh, you will not understand this ever. And there are assumptions that probably no human is able to understand every aspect of this thing at all. What we need to know is how this works because the 6.9 billion transistor chip sits in our smartphone. We need to know what the, how to find out what the time is. We possibly even, you know, rarely, but sometimes we use this as a telephone. Um, we use this to check our calendars, to read our messages, to interact with others and so forth. We need to know the behavior, not necessarily how everything works in detail. Remember our sports athletes, they need to know how our body behaves. Now, how do we, if, how do we get out of balance? How do we, you know, do certain things? They don't know every single aspect within the muscle and what it does, but they know how to train it. So when we go back from the, from the detail view and to the behavioral view, what are doing, what these guys are doing, then we are far, you know, advanced. So now since we learned, okay, our brain does a lot of things that are interesting and we need to work with this. Um, we also understood that we are not creative, which is kind of a bummer for many people. But actually out of this situation that we're not creative comes something 
that we found out about a year ago. You all know that, uh, you know, think big and think bold. And this was more motivational. But we found out one thing that, you know, sparked because we're working so intensely on this. In my mind, I thought, wow, I mean, that is amazing. And here it comes. Whatever we can imagine, we can make. You know that as a sentence. You know, if you can think about it, you will be able to make it, brave guy. No, you can because all parts are experiences. We're not creative. We don't have idea sparks out of nowhere with something containing in the idea that is truly creative. We don't. It's existing experiences that form a new idea. But when this idea is formed by existing experiences, by one way or the other melting it together, and it's not just one or two, you know, which makes it kind of easy to show, but it may be a thousand experiences that combined create a new idea. Guess what? This idea is absolutely possible because all the experiences have been real. I mean, you have seen a car and you have seen, you know, the light and the sky and, you know, whatever, or felt a piece of material or heard something say something. So if you can imagine it, you can make it. And that becomes now a fact versus a motivational uh, saying. The other thing that comes out of this is everybody can be uh, amazingly creative. You can create ideas like everybody else because you have experiences like everybody else. The only difference may be how you have been grown up. You may have been grown up in a very conservative home and people say, no, don't do this, don't do that, don't touch it. No, no, come on, don't be crazy. You know, become a man, become a woman. You know, life is hard, you need a hard work. And I mean, all that in all the best uh, interest for you. But at the end of the day, to become innovative, that wasn't really helpful. But there's something else in our brain, just real quick. It's called neuroplasticity. And don't get crazy about all these words. You don't need to remember it. But you need to know the behavior. It means that our neurons connect once in a while new. And was, it was thought that this ends, this new connections, when you're between 24 and 30. But no, there are people who have new connections of their neurons, even with 80 and older. So it's understood that neuroplasticity is saying that we can reconnect our, our neurons. And so you can learn to be creative, even though your parents or your teachers or your friends or whoever in your life told you a thousand times, forget it, you are not. Well, there, there can be situations that you re, rewire your, your brain, so to speak, and you don't think, okay, how do I rewire it? No, no, no. You just realize, okay, you are a human being like anybody else. And so everybody who said you're not creative, you forget and you start being intrigued and looking at things and want to understand how this mouse works inside. And you realize there's no ball anymore like older people may want. And there's a light and this light actually sees um, the way to move it and so on. Be intrigued, you know? And sometimes people say, don't be so, you know, you, you turn everything upside down, you know? More privacy, yeah, but intriguement is good. So um, with that said, we are composed of things, logically, right? We are, we are physical, but so are our ideas. If we understand that our ideas are physical, physical experiences from listening, hearing, touching, every senses we have, and composed to a new concept of whatever, but from existing things, then we know that creation of ideas is not magic at all. And it's not random and it's not, you know, divine or anything. I mean, it's a little bit demystifying idea creation, but it's good to know all the ideas are composed of things. And if things exist, then also our new ideas may become into existence. So Let's look into the terrain. That is another key thing for our athletes for many reasons. And we realized that there's, I wrote a blog post once, you know, the first 
um, the initial value of an idea is zero because you have gazillion ideas which all have no value because they would all have never been put to work and never been tested actually with people who should benefit from these ideas. So therefore we need to understand the terrain. And here I think is an amazing uh, uh, example of how our brain actually is able to create innovation and how the same brain with no experience in a specific area just cannot deal with it. So this is a, a electric car, you know, the brand probably, um, it has this huge display. And customers, at least to a larger degree, like this display and other people say, no, this is dangerous, this is distracting from driving, never we will have a big display. And yet others say, well, then I buy this other car because there is no rule saying you cannot have a big display. But the display didn't come from steering up the world, but from the from somebody who is a truly digital person, in this case, actually the CEO of that company, and wants this experience. I mean, I have a very large screen. Um, yeah, I can deal with a cell phone too, but if I wanna do something bigger than just you know doing quick messages and so on, I need a large screen. You cannot construct anything like with, a, with an AutoCAD or any of these CAD systems uh, without a large screen. So what happened if you, if you, if you look at the screen below here, you get maybe the situation of the car, you have a big map and all kinds of things. And yes, it's true, it's distracting. But, you know, this way, you know, this car was built with a large screen and, and emphasizes the digital experience more than anything else. And most of us, younger people, not me, uh, us, younger people are completely digital. So, a next iteration was thought to be maybe do it this way. The screen is a little bit higher. It's actually now uh, horizontally oriented and so on. So people play with this idea. And even the larger companies, I mean, the big, the big brands uh, uh, like you know Mercedes, BMW and so forth, now considering large screens in the cars because the market wants the digital experience. So and here comes something that is actually a classic for innovation. The market wants the digital experience. Somebody has it, so let's build what they have. And that is the least innovation uh, aspect in the world. And the classic in this case is there are people who actually had a far more innovative concept, but they lacked of the experience, the digital experience themselves. They just wanted to have something cool for them and never brought it really to market, never understood how the market actually works, our terrain. And I picked this example because we're talking about multi-billion, almost trillion dollar investments over a longer range in the automobile industry. And that will be that. I mean, this is something that in the luxury cars, like a big BMW, a big Mercedes, a big Porsche and so on, you have the so-called head-up display. And I have the luxury to, uh, to have one of those. And that experience is obviously superior over the large display on the side where I have to look down. And here I never lose the touch with the street. But it was only for the sort of speak for the big guys. And not this is not a standard equipment in any car. But that would be, I mean, here it's still simple. It's still, I mean, you have the same on the display like you have on your dashboard. But instead of the display, you obviously could easily have, oh, there's a gas station behind this, uh, this curve. There is other things uh, you could show real quick if the car has some problem and you show real quick, okay, it's on your left rear axle and, you know, where, wherever. But this would have been a future design. But what is the company doing? They said, oh, people wanna have big display, so let's put it this big display in, instead of extending this, making this in any car and let people experience with their version of innovation, because this was truly innovative. It was probably too innovative and too complex for the car manufacturer of the other car. So they had to do the display in order to, uh, you know, do something special in a different way. But because of their marketing power that they developed very quickly, 
they became innovative with this big display, where the others couldn't bring it to market. And I, again, I use this, this example because the idea is something, if you cannot bring the idea to market, you can have the best idea on the globe and it will not work. Um, a, a founder come, came to me one day and sorry, I have this. It was an energy pack like, like this watch here, that size. And it was a, <clears throat> a liquid energy, not a generator, a transformer. You could load, I believe, 10 uh, cell phones a day for a whole month and it had enough energy to do that. And all you put in is gas, you know, from a, from a lighter, the gas. So it was an interesting thing. And he wanted me to invest and I was gung-ho. I thought, whoa, this is really cool. And I was talking to him and I realized he was a monoculture in his brain. I mean, he was the scientist. He would not allow any co-founder, even so he said, yeah, yeah, I, I, will, I will have some co-founders. And then he introduced me to somebody who was actually, he was hired to be the co-founder. And so this company could never bring it to market. And so I didn't fortunately invest because the company went out of business. Idea great, go to market, terrible, and story is worthless. I mean, there's not even a little bit of a, I mean, this company actually went bankrupt. Um, so experience and an innovation, and then bring it to your terrain or to your market. And if one or the other is not existing, it doesn't work. So third step, equipment and training. So we started with what you see here in the background a little bit. We started with paper canvases. So we had a deep innovation design canvas and we had eight different canvases. But we realized when we work in teams and the concept of canvas, I guess is not new to you. Um, it seems nice and somebody can fill it in, but if you have 10 people, how do 10 people fill in one canvas? Not only that there's not enough space, how do you do that? And so we started to do it electronically and this, this is a first version that you see here, but you see there's multiple names in the same field and obviously you can scroll this up and down and so forth. But now with multiple canvases, 10 in uh, uh, 10 fields on average in six canvases. Let's assume you have a team with 20 people and you also involve 50 customers. You come up with about 4,000 ideas and inputs that you have to enter there. So we needed to know how to do that. Um, first in physical environment, we thought this is never gonna work because here's another limitation of our brain. It's very you know compositive, but what we cannot do is deal with lots of lots of data, simple data. If we have to process that, this is not part of our brain. But our brain is creative enough to build tools that allows us to do that. You know, we're as humans, we're not built to lift a ton of material, but we're able to build a crane that lifts a ton of material. We cannot deep dive into the water, but we can build a submarine. We cannot fly, but we can build a plane. And so what we realized what's very interesting is we cannot think in certain degrees, but we can think of something that can help us do that. And so we came up with this multidimensional uh, canvas and multidimensional is a big word, but it's able to, at least, I mean, we, we, we tested out, I mean, we can put in 50,000 ideas theoretically. The challenge then is to sift through automatically through 50,000 ideas and sorts them and value them. And so here's coming back to AI, uh, there, there are tools uh, we, can, we can use there. So with the tools, we also realized we need to understand the flow of the innovation. And so we came up with this thing called um, uh, um, the, the innovation journey map. And obviously we need a dashboard to show the results, not all of the content, but the results to the management team. And so we thought, okay, we need to build one of those two. So get a global view, detailed view, get the KPIs, the processes, the budgets, the global, the selected, the teams, the alerts and so forth. And so we begin to build these uh, innovation management systems basically to be able, just to be able to actually manage our ideas. Because if 
many people come together with great ideas. What we did in the past, we put red and blue stickers, and the more stickers somebody had, that idea was good, right? And then we had one after our brainstorm session, and we went through it. At the end of the day, I mean, when you think through all this, what a waste. I mean, how many good ideas go basically bust by that process? And also this process is not able to actually even get the good ideas because the brainstorm sessions are over after an hour, maybe two, and after two or three hours, I mean, you know, we're totally exhausted. But because we're exhausted, we say, okay, finish, over. We don't give it another try. <laughs> Why not? Nobody knows. We just didn't know that another try would lift it, the whole innovation scape up one more time. And yet another time, one more time. So profound innovation transformation in less than 50 years, very much like our, our guys with, uh, in the sports world, the athletes. Yeah, absolutely possible. And it will be less than 50 years this time. I can, I'm 100% I'm sure. So the innovation journey map that we developed is actually very obvious. People said, yeah, but I mean, what, what's, what's different here now? Team, yeah, innovation, uh, assessment, or you know, we, we call it something else. Um, deep innovation design, idea validation, disruptive moment. Okay, yeah, disruptive moment is maybe something new. Uh, we need to finance it, we need to go to market. But when we ask every single step, how did you do and what did you do? Uh, validation, yeah, okay, hmm, of course, yeah, I mean, actually, we didn't do a lot there, <laughs> okay, so how, if, if the idea is not validated, where do, when do you know when it's, when it's good or not, you know, we build a prototype, then we go into the market and blah, 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 okay, how much money did you spend in that process, that was probably five to ten million, okay, right there, to five to 10 million for nothing. And you can do this not 50 times, but when you go iterate through your ideas with many sub ideas and make the idea validation a process, you can go 50 times, you can iterate through 100 times with not a dime spent. Then on the, on the innovation finance side, nobody knows what the innovation actually will cost. And therefore most innovation that actually happens in enterprises don't go through because at some point, you know, you need more and more and more money and the CFO said, okay, you know what guys, I mean, you had your time, uh, we cannot do this further. Why not? I mean, startups take seven years to go to an IPO. Yeah, but we, we I mean, we don't see any, any output here. So we don't know when and how to finance what. And if you go through the whole curve, then we realize all the innovation labs are try and error. And that is expensive. And that is actually for most companies unaffordable because theoretically you would need to go through hundreds of try and error. And that is way too expensive. So the good news here for our C-level guys, and that is sort of the ground zero innovation strategy. We can go from ex experimentation to a strategic innovation. And if we have a process, and if we know how our brain actually creates ideas, and if we have a good training, and if we know the terrain, particularly the terrain, then actually we get very strategic and manageable. And there is no try and error and experimentation anymore. So we looked at a couple of companies, I mean, who invited us and we realized every single company, every single enterprise that we spoke to had an innovation lab. And guess what? They're filled with engineers, specialists, and all, all these guys who apparently were able to build what a good idea has brought to them, but they couldn't really create the idea. And even those who try to create something out of an idea, some product, didn't have the access to the market, couldn't verify and so forth. So it was, a, I mean, billions are spent in this regard, but the outcome is, sorry, is just almost zero. But now we can do that change. Um, and so the first step is a, we call it dream team assembly. So and we need to have innovative minds, but that doesn't mean they're trained to be innovators. They're not magic. They're just people who are open to reflect on new things. They're open to, okay, if you can train me to catch good ideas, then I will do that. They have an entrepreneurial spirit. 
they're not always asking, no, what do I get for this? And I have an idea, how much do I get? Well, this is a billion dollar idea. At least I want to have a quarter of a billion. Um, they know that the billion dollar idea costs 990 million to actually produce. So, I mean, th and this is why most of these ideas actually suffer because people think this is a huge value, which it isn't the, the, the raw idea. The making is in the value, you know? Um, curiosity, uh, meaning, okay, I want to know what this stuff does. I open it, I mean, like a kid. And these kids in, in people uh, are, are critical. Openness, of course, openness meaning, okay, not always thinking this is not gonna work. Uh, the first the first, <laughs> first version of anything is not gonna work. Uh, that doesn't help. And engaging, I mean, okay, Let's try. Let's 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 give it a shot. I I believe uh, we have a chance here because in this competition in this composition it will work. So actually very normal con conditions, and this is not depending on education, not depending on where you grown up, how you grown up, who grew you up. It doesn't mean in a specific country of a specific religion of a specific philosophy. It really doesn't matter. We have these kind of people across the world in any developed, undeveloped, underdeveloped, experienced and non-experienced uh, country on this planet. So the th second step is then innovation opportunity discovery. It doesn't make sense to hope for an innovation that comes out of nowhere because innovation are not created out of nowhere. Ideas don't come as a spark. So it makes sense to understand in your given market, where do you want to have the innovation? And if people, I mean, this is what I hear, yeah, but all of a sudden somebody comes out of blue with great ideas, so how do we deal with that? Well, you know, analyze how they came to this idea, and there's a pattern, and you know, we talked about how our brain works a little bit, and if you know more about that, then we know that these ideas don't come out of nowhere. The company may come out of nowhere, but the ideas don't come. It's a logical consequence of understanding the dreams of the and, and, and the needs of the audience. And if they reach out and talk to them constantly, they will realize, okay, that is what they all want. So let's build that. And they will outperform any enterprise because even once it's built, they don't understand how they could win. Hotels still don't understand why Airbnb is winning. The company is 10 years old, Airbnb, still don't understand. I mean, theoretical, that is unimaginable, <laughs> but it's, that's the way it is. And so observation, listening, discovering, finding the real challenges, no magic. You just have to listen and really listen what they say, not coming with an answer or even with an argument why that is wrong what they think. No, listen, discover how they do things observe how they want to touch something and so on. And then you come based on the interviews and based on, on working with them, what they really, really need. And you don't need, even if you have a million customers or a billion customers, you don't need to talk to all of them, but don't talk always to the same. Um, and so, you know, you have a chance to get to a disruptive idea probably within six to nine weeks, weeks, not months. So then you, get to the deep innovation design process. And this is what I said earlier, multiple dedicated ideas catching in a session, multiple, because there are multiple. And don't put the sticker on what is the best idea and disregard the others. I mean, there is no best idea. There are only very good ideas and you can combine them later on all to something. Um, we go far beyond brainstorming because we realized brainstorming was a really good idea, I have to say, and was sort of the first step. And we're trying to take the next step because we also realized that there's far too many ideas were basically underwater, or gone away. And then there was a rush into making something happening. Um, and the outcome was basically you know, I mean, I don't want to say nothing. I mean, there was good outcome, but not really innovative, not disruptive, not changing the world. And we're all humans and, and there's no more intelligent. I mean, there are more intelligent people than others, but intelligence actually is another thing. And 
I don't want to go too deep into the into the mind, but intelligence sometimes is actually a border, is a barrier for great ideas. And this is why artists, I mean, oftentimes seen as, wow, these are all crazy guys, so let them alone. Yeah, they are crazy, but they come up with amazing ideas, amazing compositions. Um, <clears throat> so when we go to the deep innovation design process, we come up within a week um, approximately. So this is not a one hour brainstorming, we're working a week on in different steps to get to amazing ideas. And this is not a theory. I mean, we started with this actually five years ago with the first of our startups. And we realized on and on and on, we find at least 50% of the teams actually come up with disruptive ideas, which was, I mean, everybody I spoke to and my my peers and other accelerators, everybody saying, yes, I mean, come on, you cannot build an innovation that is something completely new, everything changing with a process that is impossible. Uh, yeah, I didn't care <laughs> like I didn't with my companies. And today we know it is possible or imp is impossible as long as we think this is magic. This is just accidental and just happens. But it is possible when we realize that ideas are not magic and they're just don't random coming, uncontrollable. I mean, our brain is everything but random. It's a very, very proceduralized uh, mechanic that is built by nature and it, it performs its actions uh, in accordance to that plan. So the next step is idea validation. Still, we haven't built even a prototype. We haven't done any line of code. Uh, we didn't do anything that sort of newer ideas uh, actually indicates that, you know, build and have a, have a crazy session and do whatever you want and then go to the market and wonderful. You know, we have, I think, 10,000 hackathons. So if even 10% even came out of these hackathons, we would probably do all hackathons. But it's nice to see that they, they come out great idea and it's young people. And so it's good to see them come out with something crazy. But none of the really big ideas came out of hackathons. So but it's the best we could do so far. And so we don't stop, we stop with this process here and say, okay, idea validation before we even hack, before we even build, before we prototype, before we wrote a line of code, we get with our intelligent concept, so to speak, to our customers. And so we have to tell them, yeah, this is what we're working on. And forget they can steal it and the competition and I mean, all the yada, yada, yada argument why we don't. Just forget about that because this is suicide. And so if we, if we come back from the market saying, well, this is really cool. Now we can actually, because we listened, we can predict the success. We can basically build KPIs based on the response. And then we can actually start building it. But even before that, we need to know what it cost because our CFO would be breathing down our neck. I mean, very quickly saying, okay, I mean, you're talking about 50,000 and what did you do? Um, yeah, we need another 50. What do you have then? Yeah, probably a prototype. Probably or really, I mean, and <clears throat> so that is something why innovation labs get killed right and left and rebuild because it seems the people were wrong or the money was too, list, too, too, too few. We didn't know. And so therefore, let's continue our process with a validation and then build possibly a financial plan and then start building it. So the initial value of an idea is zero. I mentioned that before, and I want to repeat that because this is critical to understand. The idea, no matter how disruptive it is, no matter how innovative it is, it has no value. We have to agree this the same way we have to agree that we are not creative, we're compositive. And the value of the idea is created when it's put into the market. But before that, value is zero. There is no value. It's only cost. There is no value to gain. Um, and it makes it takes millions and billions to get this into the market. I mean, if you look at, take all the best startups that started maybe five or seven or 10 years ago, 
and uh, Airbnb, Uber. Um, I mean, you 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 take any any one that you like, and then you look what the last rounds of funding were before they really became mainstream. And then you kind of check, you can check this online. This is all the data are available, at least from California companies or from US companies. You realize, okay, wow, they have eaten up what? 100 million, 500 million? What the last round was a billion? Are these all crazy? Well, the funny thing is in Europe, for instance, and even more so in many Asian countries, people say, you know, this is totally crazy. It's totally overvalued. We will never do that. And they never did. Now look at how many unicorns that actually have become the Ubers and the Googles and the Facebooks and I mean, you name it, you know, even non-electronic companies, Tesla and, and stuff that is coming up. No, we, we don't want to pay so much money. So therefore we'd rather have no innovation. And that is the same thing in corporates. So once we got to the financing part and we built the first product, then we go into the market with a plan accordance to what we get financed for. And if the finance uh, plan shows, okay, this will cost 200 million or 500 million, well, then everybody knows. And if the CEO and the CFO decide, well, we don't have that money and we cannot spend it, well, then you can stop the operation right there and you don't need to waste more money for something that you hope magic comes. I mean, it's like dancing for rain. We don't do that anymore. You know, we don't circle around the board's board uh, table and do some dance and hope it's raining. Um, so this is becoming logical now and manageable, as you said earlier. Um, so we can go into the market with whatever we decided we can spend. And then there's scaling. And I put this picture particularly because you no know, scaling is, is a big deal, as you can see. And that cost, again, and it needs you know, to be planned and financed and managed. And this doesn't come out of nowhere. And if you say, yeah, we have that. Yeah, sure. You developed it over the last 50 or 100 years, but you don't have this maybe for your next product, which is a different product, disrupts, is innovative. So you start from scratch. And maybe you can leverage lots of parts of your existing organization, but that is hopefully that you have planned you know, accordingly to that as an objective, scale. And if you don't scale your innovation, why do it in the first place? So in order to get there, and you realize, I mean, we're, we're trying to be as logical as we can and as little emotional and uh, uh, um, uh, crazy as we can, we needed to have methods. And this was another debate we had once in a while with people, you know, how do you can build methods for innovative approaches? Yeah, we can, because we can find out what is the best team composition. We can find out where is the biggest opportunity for our innovation based on the market and based on all the understanding and all the previous investment we had into this market, where is the best opportunity? And we can dive deep into our innovation process to build the best possible product for this market, the ideal product. And if we get the ideal product, even though we can't build it right now, we will build it down the road and that will disrupt that market. Then we do the in-market idea validation, in-market idea validation. Forget idea validation in labs completely. I mean, it's the same thing. Don't, don't dance for rain, you know, go into your market then disrupt the business model, uh, disruptive business model for the thing that you actually created because disruptive business model and disruptive technology are two completely separate things. You can merge it to something even more powerful. I did that twice, but you can't have a disruptive business model without a disruptive technology. Think about my old company, Computer 2000. I mean, we started with $15,000 and we became a $10 billion company. Obviously, we had also multiple rounds and obviously, you know, our equity part shrank, but still became a $10 billion, a $5 billion company. So disruptive business model is a key, all, all, almost more than a disruptive technology. Airbnb, you know, a platform to rent apartments, that is not disruptive, but the way they did it in the market they had that was disruptive. 
I mean, two apps on mobile phones, nothing disruptive. But the business model to use that inside the taxi market with a market presence that was very, very complicated, well, that was disruptive. Then the long-term innovation financing, long-term, purposely long-term. The short term, and then we will see. I mean, don't give you that. I mean, your your investors don't deserve, you know, that kind of management because it's most likely not working and probably didn't in the past. I mean, today everybody agrees this is okay. Try it out, figure it out. Yeah, try to be as innovative as you can because nobody knows how. Everything is okay, but when you know, then it becomes not okay anymore. Then the deployment. And we use two terms, deployment and go-to-market, because innovation is not only an innovative product to disrupt the market. You can also be very innovative internally. You know, you have old processes. You may have old ways of doing things. You may even have old technology, but there is nobody with better technology. Maybe you want to invent something that is perfect for what you do. And don't shy away from the word perfect. The perfect or ideal solution is what is an innovative solution. Go for perfect to get at least close to it rather than settle with average because average is not innovative. And then finally, and this is a key thing as well, innovation continuum. I mean, you may have an innovative solution, an disruptive solution, go into the market or internally for now, but what is in five years? Somebody else coming with something better? Probably. So you cannot even stop. The innovation becomes a continuum because you will need to continue your own process. And there is a, I talked about the innovation tree before. I mean, when you look at how innovation has gone in the last 10,000 years, you will realize that it never stops. And this is why some companies fade out and new companies come in. But that is not a logical kind of live and die process. Because the people still exist and companies are people. They don't die. I mean, eventually they die, but the company goes not out of business because this is a cycle that we all have to agree, you know, come out, coming from nature. This is a cycle because we did not understand how to innovate. And that is why companies fade away. So bring your team to top performance by helping them uh, innovate uh, in a way that they never have been possible to before. And it's about understanding how innovation is going, it's understanding our terrain, and it's understanding the tools. So deep innovation design is actually something that has an amazing corporate innovation future because we now can manage it. And I can tell you every single manager on the planet, if they have something that they can now manage versus they have to just let the people play, that changes the landscape, I mean, fundamentally. And that means also with team empowerment to a new level, there is actually a new way of making a career. There's a new way of partnerships. I mean, more people can go and help because we know we need trainers and ideally from the external side, not to help people <laughs> at a business, but all trainers in the world of athletes are not at the same time athletes, not anymore. They may have been one, but not anymore. And so that is where somebody needs to reflect on what they see to tell you. And we do the same in the innovation space. So um, last but not least, where do we start? Because you will want to start somehow. So we have a half day, and this is a little bit advertising. I, I think it's okay. Half day entrepreneurs uh, online seminars that uh, we just ran for for, low, uh, for global company, uh, 600 managers from 80 countries. And so similar to what we do here, but very dedicated to their needs. So we help them um, get off the ground for the first time. And before we, or they invest, they want to figure out, okay, is this reflecting on them? Do they like the concept? Do they want to do more or less? <clears throat> and so this is how we started there. Then the next step would be two-day online training sessions. And you see it's everything online, um, not because we don't like to have the personal interactions, but you know why, at least for now. Um, and then there is a six-week deep innovation design workshop. We start with the public, public version on May 26th. 
So um, there's also deep uh, free access to the Blue Neuron, which is our system. So you can play with it and you can experience it for yourself. Um, but the, the core here is in six weeks, we want the teams that join uh, uh, the program to actually be truly innovative and coming out with something where I say, I could not imagine that this is working. And this is not a test, this is nothing new. Uh, that's actually what we did with our startups last four years. Um, the Blue Neuron platform, um, it's not fully available, I have to say. I mean, we're, we're pushing very hard. Uh, will be available for 120 bucks per user per month, a very classic SaaS model. And uh, you can then develop uh, to the nth degree. And um, if you want to know more about that, you can talk to us. Um, I know we have we have guests from 24 countries, so uh, we have partners in I would say half of the countries, and so people are local on the ground. Uh, we're developing our partner network going forward, but I also have to say we have um, just a handful of clients under our wings, so to speak. Um, we want to get a little bit more experience. Um, but for us, it's, it's, it's fantastic to see that these early adapters, how these companies are called also, um, are really interested to uh, play because and, and one, one of the, uh, one of the um, innovation managers said, you know, we have been playing for five years, so there's no real problem to play just another half year with something that seems to be tangible. So for us, this was probably the biggest compliment. Um, and uh, yeah, with that, I think... Um, I, I give it back to, to Marita. Um, I didn't watch actually a chat while talking, uh, if there are questions, so uh, please put in the chat box or raise your hands. I don't know exactly how Marita wants to handle that. So yeah, we got a lot of questions, actually, I have to say, during the presentation. And there is one I wanted to address. Do you hear me? Yeah. Ah, okay. How to improve innovation in big companies without creating having processes and motivate all teams to innovate? Uh, okay. Yeah, that's actually a good question. <clears throat> so, the innovation, you know, the innovation process takes a small team. Uh, it's about 10, 12 people, and a company. I mean, we're the current companies we're working with are global enterprises. I mean huge pharmaceutical uh air, airline uh bank an automaker so they have all the same problem where do we start and none of them should and will not start okay we do this globally except actually one company but um you know you start with a with a cell uh you may inform your your company that you want to do that and um and then we we can form smaller teams to start with the one thing, the one challenge we actually realized uh, late last year, and so we thought, oh wow, this was something we haven't thought about. Um, it's a public company, and the public company, because of our concept, had a hard time to involve customers. Because if they are on the track to invent something unique, then they are actually obliged to inform their investors that something like that is going on. Otherwise, this would be kind of an uh, kind of an inside situation. And so there, there are two answers to that. One is make it with selected customers and let them sign an NDA and let them and tell them that because of the uh, in the investor protection laws, they are not. I mean, they're legally obliged to con con comply with uh, comply with the um, with the NDA. It's not just an NDA, don't talk about because of our competition. Uh, there's a legal implication. What what they how, did, however, was actually interesting because they thought, yeah, we don't feel comfortable. We make an announcement to our investors that we're working on something like that. And they did. And voila. I mean, it was out. And the interesting thing was that we heard is the competition thought, oh, come on, you know, pff, no, they just want to do PR. Okay, so that was good for them. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, start with a small team. I think that's a short answer. And we can help you to, to select that. Another one is in regards, how can I learn more about the method? Is there any specific documentation or online training? 
sorry, I, I didn't hear the question. Can you? How did you? The question was, uh, it's Peter, how can I learn more about the methods? Is there any specific ah. documentation or online training? Okay, um, so yes, so the methods is something that we, we handle in the trainings. Um, and um, I started to write a book about actually the methodology and it will be available probably in fall this year. So I'm a little bit behind, I'm sorry for that. But in the training, we're talking about uh, the methods. There are basically eight methodologies or methods to, to, to go through that and I, I mentioned before, yeah. Questions coming in. So there's one question. Uh, how does the six week innovation program works? Can I come with the whole team? And is there a price list for the corporate uh, webinars? Um, okay, yeah, that's actually a very good question. I think we have we have it on our website, you know, how how it works. So it, it is very similar to our accelerator. So so there is a boot camp. Unfortunately, we have to do it online uh, these days, but um, <clears throat> there's a boot camp the first week, and then you work on your own project projects, and then you're, there's another session, another session that is Mondays and Fridays, typically sessions where you present, and everybody learns from everybody else. And uh, at the end of the six weeks, you should have actually an innovative solution. Uh, this may be a business model or maybe a technology. Um, what we haven't done, we got this, this question actually recently. Um, so yes, we will have a different price if somebody comes with their entire team. Um, we have a limitation on the, on the bootcamp uh, in terms of the size. Otherwise we couldn't be really you know, helpful enough if it would be too big like this one. I mean, we have, I believe, what is it, 200 people or so. Uh, so it's limited to 25 people and we can do it with two company teams or even one company team. Um, so so that's, that's, that's something we have to see what would, best, would work best for you. Another question is, can you say something about the idea validation, how to do that? So the, the validation is um, just real quick, it's in the market with customers and we, over the years, basically develop a few um, a few sentences that that are really important to do. This is nothing nothing secretive. Uh, there are about eight sentences, so eight questions, and um, we actually um, give it give it give it a try with six. So there are six questions that you should ask, and that's all you need. Definitely not thirty or fifty or anything like that, and. Um, the, the key to the validation uh, is never do a survey, never ever. Um, you know, surveys is, first of all, you know, people ran through um, and with surveys, you get only people who say, oh, okay, yeah, I have time. I have time in my, my whole life. So yeah, I sit down and do that. And the key people with the brain who have just pounded with work, uh, they will not do that. So the most important people with creative solutions for you will probably not participate. So talk to them, interview them digitally or physically, doesn't matter, but talk to them. And then in the validation, there are the two aspects. And therefore, when you, when you make the interview, ask the person if he's ready and okay to do this with camera in a web session, because there are two aspects. One is the answers to the question, and the other is the emotional component. So people may say, yeah, that was really interesting. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I thought it was cool. Yeah, I'll say, hey, this was really cool. I mean, I was very excited when I saw this. The same answer, but very different emotions. And you will see in, in the process that when you put the emotions and the logical answers together to brain house, right? You get a very different result. And so this, this, this is basically the, the whole concept, the whole quote unquote trick, our secret sauce of, of the validation. Okay. And giving the time, one last question. Amazing story, thanks Axel, that comes from Australia. I like the multi canvas solution. What does the system do to go through thousands of ideas? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that is a challenge and I have to be very honest with you. 
So currently we're able to capture everything and we make it relatively easy for the author of the, of the content to, to rank it and others to rank it too. So it's a community effect at the end. Obviously not everybody wants to go to, through thousands of questions and that is actually also not needed. But there are people not, also in your team then, if you have 10 to 15 people with different skills and different traits, they will look for different things. So if it's thousand and you have 10, you know, you divide it down to 100 for, for one of them. And so continue, continuing right now is, uh, is somewhat of a manual process, but with some mechanism that certain people will see, not see, everybody sees everything, but certain people will see, or traits, you know, sort of the marketing or the expert and so forth, will see uh, different, different flags as you'll probably, no, not on this screen. Um, <clears throat> and so, so they can focus on what's interesting to them or select just those, those uh, ideas or, or feedbacks. And so we trim it down and then come up with some summaries, which is further below this, this slide here. Um, and so, so you, you, can, you can work with a team of 10 to 15 people, even through a thousand of, or 2000 of feedbacks, relatively easily compared to a, what we did in the past. What we hope to do that uh, we also know, and you also know, I mean, AI is a good thing and it's, it's very intriguing, but it has its limitation. And we realize the limitation of an AI system in a creative process. We know that AI systems can paint, quote unquote, creative pictures, but this is only because these creative pictures are also just sort of compositions of existing stuff. So we cannot, we cannot find a way right now. And if any, any of the AI guys are here, uh, help us. We cannot figure out a way with creative, unique ideas to compose through iteration, because that's what their neural networks do. Uh, something special um, couldn't find a way yet. But we will actually try to to make a to make a, not a hackathon, but a but a but a way of inviting people to to help us with that question. Because most AI people are actually looking for 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 jobs or for tasks that are really critical, and uh, so we might do that. Okay. Thanks, Axel. I also got one question, and I think it's important. It, it's the last one. <laughs> uh, in regards our invited developing countries. So thanks, Daniel. Developing countries like Ghana invest only one percent of the GDP in R and D. And meanwhile, business are not ready to invest in R&D. So the question is, how can someone go through the methodologic innovation process you know, without that high investment? Now, that is a cool question um, and happy to answer that one. So, you know, I, I see this in many countries that people look at statistics, what corporates or governments do or not do and so forth. Innovation is something that is exclusively with no absolutely no uh, alternative individual to those who want to be innovative. So that's a very personal decision. I want to innovate. I want to do something out of the ordinary in this and this space. And I see there is a problem, then you solve it. Uh, you don't need to look for big time funding because when you go through the, theoretically, if you go through the six weeks process, you need to have the time for the six weeks. Um, Yes, there is a price ticket and, you know, for every emerging countries, I know that um, the World Innovation Forum has a uh, stipendium. And so, so you can get one of these stipends uh, for, for that program as well and then innovate. And as soon as you have come out of this process with an innovative idea, um, I'm relatively sure you get funding for the next steps, at least for the next probably six months because right now funding is very, very limited through this uh, global pandemic. I mean, yeah, every pandemic is global. Um, and um, you, you, will, you will need to bootstrap through this phase. And I mean, sorry to say that every, every entrepreneur had to go through that, um, but we will help you to go through that because at one point the innovative idea will become something significant that people will fund you. I mean, that that is, almost 100% sure. 
And also, when I said earlier, we couldn't get funding in the first place, we always got funded because we very quickly um, proved the concept with early customers. So, and in particular, whether it's Ghana, uh, Ghana was it, I guess, or was it Uganda, um, doesn't matter. A any of the countries where the World Innovations Forum is and you know where, where we have been in the past um, has the same problem that any innovator has. You know, it's, it seems too risky, I don't know, and so on. You have to overcome that situation. This is why we actually started the foundation to help do that. But um, you know, don't don't look or hope for somebody else. Just be in the driver's seat yourself, because you can. You know. Okay, giving the time. Thank you, everyone. It was a really great, great pleasure uh, with you today. We will have another session for this webinar tonight at 6 p.m. So if you want to. Uh, invite your colleagues, feel free, but also on our web page, you will find the dates of all Future Society 3 webinars. We have on LinkedIn, on Facebook, we have our groups, so happy to invite you to continue the discussion or, as I said, reach out via email. And with that, on behalf of the Society 3 and World Innovation Team, thank you very much for joining. It was great having you with us and, you know, 24 countries, that is really, this is something I really like, uh, besides the meeting you in person. Have a great rest of the day. Reach out to us and bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.